You ready? Good morning. I'm Dr. Robin Cohen uh, from the USC School of Medicine. I'm also the chairman of the Workforce for Media Relations and Communication for the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Welcome to the press conference of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons annual meeting. Uh, we have three very provocative and scientifically interesting uh, manuscripts to present to you this morning. Uh, the first is entitled, Transplanting Pig Hearts into Sick Babies May Be Promising Temporary Treatment Option. The presenter will be Dr. David Cleveland from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Dr. Cleveland. First, I want to thank Dr. Cohen and the Society of Thoracic Surgeons for the opportunity to speak to the press about some work we've done at, at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And, uh, we, uh, and I also wanted to say that I'm very pleased that Dr. Backer will be accommodating on uh, our paper. He always has insightful comments, and I'm sure uh, that will prove to be so. This is a collaboration at the University of Alabama at Birmingham with our Xenotransplant Program, our Division of Pediatric Cardiology, and our Division of Cardiac and Thoracic Surgery. And I can say that without our Xenotransplant Program, none of this work would have really been possible. We want to give special acknowledgement to David Ayers from Revivacor in Blacksburg, Virginia. He provided the uh, blood, both the wild type blood and the blood from the genetically engineered pig for this study. And uh, so uh, just an acknowledgement of, of that. The idea of xenotransplantation is not new. This is, a, this is a picture taken from the cover of Time in 1938. It has on the cover Charles Lindbergh and Alexis Carell. Alexis Carell actually won the Nobel Prize in 1912. But before that, he became very interested in transplantation. And it's very significant that his comments in 1907, he said, the difficulty in finding organs suitable for transplantation on man must be met. He identified as a source, interestingly enough, in 1907, the pig, as a potential source for transplant of the organs. He said it would be the ideal source. But in all probability, it would be necessary to immunize the organs of the pig against the human serum. So in 1907, he got it right. That in, because if you transplant an organ today without uh, doing something to the pig, it immediately rejects. And he said the future of transplantation really is dependent on heterotransplantation, or that is xenotransplantation. Well, what's the background? Primarily due to the lack of available organs, infants uh, less than one year of age have the highest wake list mortality among all patients listed for transplant. And it's really true for all solid organ transplants. And the, uh, you know, and so this lack of donors has produced a significant problem for us. And the median time, wait time now for an infant for transplant is about 108 days or so, so over th well over three months. If you look at ventricular assist devices, that is mechanical circulatory support av available for infants. It is really very, very suboptimal for those with infants, and I'll try to convince you of that as we go forward based on recent publications. But there's been recent progress in xenotransplantation that has the potential to provide a real alternative to some of the treatment strategies we now employ. Well, I don't want to belabor this to the press, but the six months survive, actuary survival of patients less than one year that have a bad place is about 48%. And this was just published second annual, uh, the PDMAX registry, which is, uh, it, which is an international registry or the, for mechanical circulatory support. In a paper in the um, Journal of, of um, Heart and Lung Transplantation, looking just at the Berlin Heart, over 90% probability of, of death for infants with, uh, uh, with a Berlin heart. And actually, of the neonates, all the neonates died. There were six of them, they all died. They 16 infants were supported with a Berlin heart, four survived a transplantation. For patients less than one year of age, the ventricular assist device is associated with higher risk of poor outcomes. And the uh, infants with congenital heart disease have a higher risk of uh, poor outcome. So if you have congenital heart disease, it's worse. 
Well, the survival of heterotopic cardiac graphs by ERA, and these are non-life supporting graphs are now out to over three years, not over 900 days or so, almost three years. And uh, that's in ERA-3. ERA-1 was before we knew about some of these carbohydrate antigens that humans will immediately react to. Well, this is, a, this is the picture of, the, of, the, of nature. And this was a publication to December of, of 2018. And in this publication, the group from Munich reported survival of life-supporting orthotopic uh, transplants into baboons that last now over 180 days. So it gives great promise to some of the things we're going to talk about. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a xenograft uh, platform where we're taking pig cells and the genetic, the genetic engineering techniques now available are, are far different than they were 20 years ago. And I, as a pediatric heart surgeon, I can't really explain those to you, but I can tell you that the ability to produce animals and that is a genetically engineered pig, and in this case would be a, what we call a triple knockout. They have all the enzymes knocked out that produce the sugars that humans will respond to almost immediately. And of course, the ability then to take the organ and then transplant it into a human being. And the, I won't belabor this easy. These are the list of the enzymes, but the important thing are in the red. These are the, these are the antigens and the way they're referred to by transplant immunologists. Gal, new 5GC and SDA. So it's very, it's really very simple. Those have to not be there in order for not, not to get really significant antibody mediated reaction. And so our research goals are to evaluate the feasibility of xenotransplantation as a bridge to allotransplantation. That is to be able to take a heart from another human being and put it in a baby by measuring the levels of preformed antibodies to these triple knockout pig red blood cells. And these pig red blood cells express these antigens if they aren't knocked out. So in a wild type, they express all that, GAL, new 5 gc and SDA, to determine increased levels of antibodies with increasing age and to investigate any increase in antibody levels and to the TKO or right blood, red blood cells in infants after heart surgery. This is just a picture, and I won't belabor this. I'm just going to convince you that these uh, triple knockout uh, uh, cells are the, very similar to humans. This is flow cytometry where we, uh, where we actually stain for the gal antigen, and it just shows that the wild type, the farther to the right it's moved as you're looking at it, the more gal is present. And so human beings and, and these triple knockout cells are virtually the same. And I will tell you, it's the same for new 5GC and it's the same for SDA. And so what we have is we have a pig that, that does not express gal, new 5GC or SDA, and the wild type would express all three of those. And so as we looked at the results of this, the methods, excuse me, I need to go back one slide. The methods, we took serum from 84 of our preoperative pediatric uh, patients, and this was all taken from our biorepository. 64 of those patients were less than one year of age. So we took uh, serum from 64 healthy human volunteers, and then serum from 25 infants that had previous cardiac surgery. We measured the antibody, level, antibody binding levels by flow cytometry to both the wild type and the triple knockout pig red blood cells. The control, it's important, the control was established by the binding level to human uh, type O negative cells. And this is how the patient groups uh, are really, uh, how they uh, exist. Uh, there were 24 neonates within uh, the group one, and none of the group one patients had any cardiac surgery before. And you can see that there were 84 pediat total pediatric patients, 64 were less than one year of age. And the, and the healthy adults, none had previous cardiac surgery, and to so a total of 148 patients. All the infants had previous, the, uh, of the 25 infants that had previous cardiac surgery comprised group two. Well, if you look at this, this is a complicated slide, but it's very simple to understand. The, the red line is control. That is the binding to, to human O negative cells. Everything above that line is positive. And so you see with a wild type red blood cell that there's no negatives after one year of age. 
for, for really for IgM and maybe one or two for IgG. And then if you look at the bottom graph, you see that there's increasing antibody uh, levels are bonding with time. In other words, with increasing age, you have increasing antibody levels. If you, now, in contrast, if you look at the antibody binding to the triple knockout red blood cells, you have absolutely no uh, levels above control, that is two human type O negative red blood cells before one year of age. And, and, and you have one that's weakly positive. I want to point out these are completely different scales. We had to expand the scale because if you notice the red line and the other was way low because everything's so high. Here it's, it's not. And the other interesting thing was uh, to us was that there's really no increase over time. There's no increase with increasing age. There's a few that fall above the line after one year of age, but not a lot. And this is a busy slide, all to, all to say that if you look to the top right, these are the patients that had previous cardiac surgery, and these are the same patients. There are, these are 20 that are the same patients. And you see that one patient actually increased significantly of, with their IgG titers. But you see that if you look at the comparison below, that's all 64 patients compared to the 25 that were exposed. There's really no significant difference in those two, two numbers. And so our conclusions are pretty simple. Humans don't develop a significant preformed antibody to TKO carbohydrate antigens in that only one patient we could identify was weakly positive. Infants exposed to previous cardiac surgery don't appear to, to develop any significant antibody response. This is important because we, we, for all of our Norwoods, we use bovine pericardial, bovine pericardium for arch reconstructions, and that, has, that expresses gal, but none of these uh, patients uh, developed an antibody response to. And in the absence of preformed antibody, we b believe that there is some potential that this could serve, that a, that a pig heart could serve as a, a bridge to transplant an infant. We'll be glad to, in the next steps, I'll be glad to go over. We're uh, performing a prospective study on our transplant population to measure antibody response to, to the peripheral mononuclear cells because they're different. And they, they express actually a, a, a swan leukocyte antigen, uh, similar to a human leukocyte antigen, and to perform cytotoxicity assays. We have to get in vivo studies with consistent six month survival in order to even think about doing this clinically. And it has to be done with an immunosuppressive regimen that's, that's approved by the FDA. And uh, we really are interested in research into immune tolerance because these, uh, these are genetically identical, which gives you a lot of leeway in order to do uh, some, some work in that area. I want to thank uh, the top uh, left is uh, the team, Dr. Cooper's team, our genotransplant team, uh, the picture of our children's hospital there, and of course we're thankful for the pigs that one day may provide some life saving as they do for pig heart valves now in supplying organs. Questions? Thank you, David. That's, it's very exciting work. We're very pleased to have Dr. Carl Backer here from the Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago to discuss it. Thank you very much. Uh, well, it's a, really a privilege for me to be here and discuss uh, this extremely important uh, uh, paper and study that Dr. Cleveland has presented. Uh, by a little way of background, uh, in 1985, uh, Dr. Leonard Bailey transplanted a baboon heart into an infant with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and that child survived for 20 days, uh, and this was reported in the New England of Journal of Medicine, and of course this was achieved without genetic engineering of the donor. Uh, if in general, if we can genetically engineer pigs to achieve successful cardiac transplantation, the care of children with these uh, critical defects would really be revolutionized. Uh, just to put uh, a little scope of the problem, uh, our current strategy for hypoplastic left heart syndrome, uh, aside from transplantation, involves uh, a staged uh, palliation, which uh, unfortunately results in only about 50% of these infants being alive five years after, after birth. And uh, there are about 1,000 uh, patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome born in the United States every year. Uh, 
We just heard in the, uh, the main uh, hall uh, a uh, report from the Loma Linda group on their results with infant uh, transplantation for hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And one of the uh, things that they talked about was neonatal tolerance. So uh, there may be a, a co combination of uh, factors that could go to making this uh, project work. We have uh, the, the genetic engineering of the pig heart, uh, the neonatal t tolerance of an infant uh, who uh, is, has not uh, yet developed uh, uh, immunologic uh, organs that uh, can strongly reject a, a donor. And then finally, uh, we, and we didn't talk too much about this, but there's always ongoing uh, developments in immunosuppression which improve these results. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Cleveland has really proposed genetic engineering of these pig hearts, which will really, I think, bring us a step closer to the original idea of Len Bailey, which was to take a baboon heart and transplant it into an infant uh, with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Uh, I truly congratulate you on your work here. This is really revolutionary and uh, uh, I, I think uh, can move our, our field uh, in a dramatic fashion. Uh, can, can I ask uh, my, a couple questions for uh, Dr. Cleveland if he wants to come up? Um, I'll start with a, <clears throat> a couple of interesting uh, concepts. Dr. Norman Shumway, of course, who is uh, one of the fathers of cardiac transplantation, stated that xenotransplantation is the future, I'm sure you've he heard this before, <laughs> is the future of transplantation and always will be. On the other hand, Dr. Uh, Sir Roy Kalm, uh, in 1995, another great pioneer in organ transplantation, said uh, transplantation, xenotransplantation is just around the corner, but it may be a very long corner. What do you think of these statements, uh, Dr. Cleveland, and who do you agree with? One, they're really smart people. And, uh, you know, I, I would say that this by no means that, that this is right around the corner. I think what this says is that there's possibilities here. And based on the results we have with infants right now, I just think we, it's, it's, the onus is on us as uh, investigators to try to find an answer for some of this because I don't see the answer in the present things that we're doing with stage palliation or I can't envision a mechanical circuitry device that's really gonna work for an infant very well. So I think that we're probably five years away if it, everything works right. And so, uh, you know, you, you have to be careful for disagreeing with really smart people. And I would just say they're really bright people. And I, I don't know when it's gonna happen, but I think this is worth pursuing. All right. Uh, the, the next question that I wanted to ask, and this is, uh, what, what do you think the most important information uh, result, is a result of your research? And what would you like the general public, the healthcare consumer, to know or understand about what you've just uh, uh, accomplished? <clears throat> You know, as I reflected on that, I think the most important information, one, is that the, the pigs can be produced really rapidly, and, and two, that you really don't, humans don't develop a significant preformed antibody response to these, even over time. And that surprised me. I mean, I really felt like that after a certain period of time, you know, adults would have a pretty substantial response to these uh, TKO RBCs, and they just don't. And so I think that's really important information, and it, it may lead us in a, in a significant direction. All right, my final question is, uh, and you touched about, a little bit about this, but if you could spot a little more, what is next? Uh, what are your plans for continued research in this area, and what capacity are you going to be moving forward? Well, the first thing, I, I think we need to look at our transplant po population prospectively and really look at a SLA typing in addition to just looking at the carbohydrate antigens and also look at uh, cytotoxicity assays. And that, those are fancy words. They just they give us more information about whether this is, could really be successful or not. Secondly, we need to start in vivo experiments, and uh, we need to replicate the work of, uh, that's been done in Munich. But I will tell you that's a daunting task because the, the cost of each one of those is probably $50,000 per, per experiment. So this is gonna take really support of the NIH or some other, I mean, maybe a company, we don't really know for sure. And then the third thing is we're really, really interested in this idea of immune tolerance. We think that, that's, that that is possible in this particular, by using these animals. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? I'd be glad to entertain anything. 
David, let me ask you one thing. I know that this is a scientific presentation, um, and I don't want to put you on the spot, uh, but given the, the organization and the scrutiny um, that has had to occur in deciding who gets donor hearts, do you foresee any ethical dilemmas in putting something in, in the meantime that, that, uh, that's more readily available um, in terms of deciding what babies get them and, and how should that proceed? The social and ethical issues are huge here and we've actually have a, um, we actually have someone that's working with us that's a, a social worker, the PhD in social work and we're sending out, um, uh, sending out uh, surveys to try to get some information back because the public's going to have to buy into this in order for this to work. And that means the organizational, the, the people that control things, the agencies that really control things. And so all that has to happen. And so there's a lot of work to be done. And, and this is apropos to Dr. Backer's question to me about when can this happen. Part of it's going to be managing all that. Because in, we realize, though, there's going to be some significant pushback. But if all, we all remember and maybe we don't remember because maybe I was the only one alive then and you. Um, there was a lot of pushback when uh, heart transplantation started. And so we're, we're hopeful, but you know, we aren't zealots about this either. We think that there's potential. Very good, thank you very much.